I got the idea of how this could be done from experiments that had been done in the 50s and 60s with REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, in which people would wake subjects up from REM sleep. Uh, I'm assuming that you all know that we have two phases of sleep and every night we go through two phases, one called non-REM or deep sleep and the other REM sleep, dreaming sleep, where we have vivid dreams and these two report, uh, alternate from uh, hour to hour approximately. Now, this subject was awakened after showing this very regular series of left, right, left, right eye movements, which you can get by taping electrodes to the outside of the eyes. And when they asked him what was he dreaming here, he said he was standing at the side of a ping pong table watching a very long volley. So this was evidence that, at least on some circumstances, that you would have a very precise correspondence between the direction that you look in the dream and the direction of your measurable gaze, the direction that the eyes move in your sleeping body. So I thought, well, since in a lucid dream I can look in any direction, I can do anything, I could make a signal. We could have a pre-agreed upon signal that I would move my eyes in a certain pattern when I knew I was dreaming. And that would be proof that I was having a lucid dream at the time. This shows an example of the last eight minutes of a REM period for one subject. Let's see if we can focus this. And this, the middle channels are eye movements from the left and right. The bottom channel here is the muscle tone of the chin. We're paralyzed in REM sleep, so we find that the muscle tone of the chin uh, decreases, especially the muscles of vocalization are paralyzed, and the top channel is brainwave. So this is all REM sleep until the end of the record there. And the subject woke up, he wrote out a report in which he said he made five signals. You can see the five signals. First one here, number one, is a left, right, left, right, two pair of eye movements, was when he realized he was dreaming, and then he starts flying around the dream world until about a, two, a minute and a half later, he thinks he wakes up. And at this point, he makes the signal, the left, right, left, right, he makes four pair of them instead of two pair. Four pair means I think I'm awake. But if we look at this, we can see that before and after the signal, he's in the same state, namely REM sleep, dreaming. So he's now dreaming that he's awake call it a false awakening. So something that you should ask yourselves right now is whether or not you have had a false awakening this morning and you think you're awake and you're not. I might not really be here. I could be a dream character. But in this case, this subject, uh, Lynn, could you focus that from back there, please? Uh, after about a minute and a half of, of strange things happen, he's trying to write out his dream report in the dream, but the uh, technician comes in the room is tearing off his electrodes. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the idea. Good, thank you. And uh, he realizes this is still a dream. So he makes a signal, left, right, left, right, but he makes an extra one. His report says, but I didn't do it quite right, so after a few seconds I repeated it correctly. And there you see, the two pair of eye movements, which is the correct signal. And then he wakes up uh, two minutes later and makes the signal for being awake. From this, we have evidence five minutes before the end of the REM period of co reflective consciousness, deliberate action, lucidity. And we also see from this case that these are not automatic signals. These are conscious messages. The subject knows what he's doing as he's doing it. We, we have um, attempted to communicate from dreams in other ways by, besides eye movements, getting people to answer that dream phone. One of which involved putting electrodes on the left and right wrists and then transmitting Morse code by twitches in the arms, by in the dream, so I'm the subject here in the dream, I realize I'm dreaming, and so I clench my dream fist as hard as I can Left, 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 and then right, and left, left. And we get these small twitches that come through in the same pattern as the fist clinches of the dream. And this is Morse code for my initials, SL. 
But you see the problems with this kind of communication is the very last twitch is barely visible. And if you happen to have a, um, a wrist that was already twitching, as you watch your cat or dog in REM sleep, you'll see that they are frequently, constantly twitching during REM. In that case, you would have the problem of not being able to see where the message was because of the noise. So we have been sticking to the eye movement signals as the most reliable means of communicating from the dream state. So once we have markers indicating where a person becomes lucid, we can then look at the physiological changes that occur when a person becomes lucid and see are there physiological conditions that will predict lucidity and are there some conditions that we could modify perhaps to encourage it. So up there in the second channel is the eye movement signal and right behind someone's head here is a marker on the, yes, on the timeline showing where that eye movement signal is. And we see some striking autonomic nervous system changes. So for example, this is the finger pulse amplitude. It determines how much blood flow is going to the hands. When you get nervous or are startled, you'll find that your hands get cool, cool and sweaty typically. That's sympathetic nervous system activation and you can see it very strongly here. It's an orientation response. The brain is saying, what's happening? And likewise, respiration goes from this uh, state of, of slow, regular respiration to more rapid and irregular. So what has happened at this moment is the subject has been startled by something that has induced a lucidity. So this may be the typical kind of dream that's happened that uh, uh, something out of social context has just occurred. This is actually uh, uh, from a 19th century lucid dreamer, the Marquis d'Hervé de Saint-Denis. He reports a dream like this where this, he's on the other side there and observes the artist walking into the room with his model in this fashion, which is a little strange. It's the artist's model, so she's attired appropriately, but not in the social context. This is a typical dream sign, a cue, that can tell you that you're dreaming. Now we have studied the physiological variations that go with these lucid dreams and uh, very briefly just summarize the kind of findings that we have by taking, uh, lining up some 80 lucid dreams with the time zero as the point where that first lucidity signal occurs and then looking at how much eye movement activity, how much heart rate, how much respiration variability and so on occurred in the 30 seconds before that and the 30 seconds before that and so on. So here we have eye movement activity and the 30 seconds right before the lucid dream begins is right here and you see it's relatively high. In fact, lucid dreams in our sample did not occur any of these 80 lucid dreams unless the eye movement activity in the period right before that was at least above the average. So that suggests a physiological requirement. Likewise, respiration rate tends to be high. There are skin potential responses that are pretty much associated with the transition at zero on the end there, and respiration rate increases in the lucid dream. Although some of what happens in the heart rate and respiration rate after the lucid dream begins may have to do with some of the things that people are doing in their lucid dreams, as you'll see shortly. We've also begun to do some studies to find out what is happening in the cortex, whether there are some specific areas of the brain that are related. Uh, we know from what you saw on the preceding slide that the autonomic nervous system is activated, but what about the central nervous system? What parts of it are activated? Is it globally activated or are there some specific areas? Th these are maps of alpha activity, uh, looking at the first 30 seconds of the lucid dream, the 30 seconds before it begins and the 30 seconds before that. Now the nose is up and ear, right ear on the right there, so we're looking at it from the top of the head down and relatively yellow means less alpha activity and therefore we presume more brain activation. And so this top three maps at the top show the difference from the reference point one minute before the lucid dream begins. And you'll see the area, the left parietal temporal cortex, the left part of the brain seems to be selectively activated. So it may be that reflective consciousness activates these higher language association areas 
in the left hemisphere. If we can validate this, we might have a means of encouraging lucid dreaming through biofeedback where we could teach people to selectively activate this particular area of the brain or let's say a ratio of activity left to right in that region, but we need to replicate this for other subjects. We have used lucid dreaming as a means of exploring mind-body relationships during the dream state and our chief research at Stanford has in fact been doing that kind of, of exploration basic research on the dream. So we can ask questions such as how long do dreams take? Uh, it's something that people have long wanted to know. But with the lucid dreamers we have a very direct way of estimating time. We can simply say, all right, in the top panel uh, we see a subject while awake carrying out this activity. Eye movement signal, then count to 10, estimating 10 seconds allowed. 1,001, 1,002, up to 10. Second eye movement signal and then estimate counting to 10, estimate 10 seconds without counting and then make a third signal and that's what you see in the waking state on the top. Later that night, exactly the same thing is occurring in REM sleep. Lynn? And in REM sleep we see that um, we have the eye movements here, a count to 10, eye movement again in an estimation of 10 seconds. You can see how closely they correspond there. Now the difference is in REM sleep we see no EMG, no muscle activity of the chin because the person is counting out loud in their dream, in her dream in this case. And the, the muscles are paralyzed well while she was awake they're not. But other than that there's a very precise uh, correspondence and appearance. And so this says that it takes as long to do something in a dream as it does if you actually do it, if you provide all the details. That makes sense if you're thinking of dreaming as involving the brain, which uh, I certainly do. I'm assuming that we have the same processes going on in the dream as we have right now. That's the same constructive process that gives rise to this world, gives rise to the dream world. Uh, I, uh, one other area of psychophysiology that we had studied was respiration, which something that, in, that uh, I first wondered about when I was five years old. And this was in the strange context of being underwater in a dream and looking up at the surface of the water of the ocean far above and thinking, I can't hold my breath this long. Oh, but this is a dream and it's okay. And feeling a puzzle, well, is it because I can breathe dream water <laughs> or, or in my dream I can hold my breath? And of course the answer is that, well, that's got nothing to do with it. It's just an idea. Your breathing is going on by itself in your sleeping body. But there is a relationship as it turns out. This is the regular respiration and we asked the subject then to make an eye movement signal and then to breathe as rapidly as he could for five seconds, make a second eye movement signal and then hold his breath for five seconds and then make the third eye movement signal and go back to regular breathing. And you can see quite clearly that that's exactly what you can observe on the record. Now I, I mentioned earlier some activities that might increase respiration rate. This statue of Bernini of St. Teresa in ecstasy describes a dream in which she had in which an angel pierced her heart with a golden arrow filling her with a fiery ecstasy. And then this dream reminded me of many of the dreams that we hear people reporting after becoming lucid. After all, once uh, you have no concern about the laws of society that can liberate a lot of behavior and especially sexual behavior, we thought of studying this from one of our own subjects who uh, after each night of recording we will compare the polygraph collected in the night, the thousand pages of polygraph paper with the reports that the subject writes out whenever they wake up during the night. Kinetic systems. I'd like to welcome you to the Near Technology Forum. And thank you all for being here.